Happy Sabbath, everyone. You must be wondering, what am I doing here when pastor is here? I don't know, some mix up. <laughs> so the title of my sermon is The Faith of the Centurion. And uh, I want to disclose that I heavily borrowed from our Sabbath school class uh, run by Dr. Weaver for this sermon. So, and uh, before we start, let me have a small prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for all your blessings, Lord. Um, I pray that you hide me behind thy throne of grace, and then only you speak. Uh, Lord, let every word that comes out of my mouth, let it be of your spirit, and then let me and everybody else here see you in a much more clearer way and have a better understanding of you and then be blessed. We ask this mercy in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. In the gospel, according to Matthew, Jesus used the expression, O ye of little faith, four times. First time he used this expression was on the mount when he was giving the sermon. We call it a ser sermon on the mount. He was talking to people about you know, worry about worrying about clothing or food and all that. Don't you worry, you of little faith. Then on three separate occasions, he used this expression addressing his disciples. And one of them was like, he was in the boat with the disciples and he was sleeping. And storm came and then everybody is so scared, they woke him up. He was like, don't you care, we're all gonna die. And then he used this expression, oh, you of little faith. Now, in the same book, Jesus also used the expression, I have not found such a great faith twice. First time when he was talking to Centurion, who asked him to heal his servant, and second time to the Canaanite woman who asked him to heal her demon-possessed daughter. In here, for the first time, we see that Jesus using a qualitative scale that starts from little to great to assess somebody's faith. I tend to think that faith is either you have faith or you don't have faith. But here, Jesus is using some sort of qualitative scale. You people of little faith and you of a great faith. What is it that makes it? How do you measure it? Do you measure it in pounds or do you measure it in like percentage or what? How do you measure this faith? Now, in general, most Christians, no matter how you measure the faith, we think that having a great faith is a good thing, right? Like, I consider that, you know, uh, I want to have great faith so that, you know, things are easy. For a long time, I used to view faith as this power that you have, right? Some sort of force that you have that you can use it and then stop the bullets. <laughs> It's like some sort of magic. That's how I used to believe faith to be. And then later on, I realized faith is like a transaction. You give tithe and God will make you wealthy. You stay obedient and then he'll hear your prayers. You fast and pray, he definitely hears you. It's like a FedEx one day shipping, you know? That's how, I mean, a lot of us actually, even in the Bible, Jews view faith as transactional. I'm keeping the commandments, now you owe me. And we can see that here in this story too. But thanks to the Sabbath school class by Dr. Weaver, which we discussed this topic for almost six, seven months, I have a new understanding. Now, there are revelations of God. These revelations come to us through nature, through scriptures, through life in general. There are several ways we get these revelations. We call them truths with a capital T. These are the big truths. Now, faith is an ability of a person to understand these truths, embrace those truths, and change their life according to those truths. How many of you felt weird when first time you heard about Sabbath? Everybody worships on Sunday and these weird people came here and talking about Saturday church. Have you ever felt that weirdness? Have you ever felt that when people told you not to eat pork and I was like, this is weird? <laughs> How many of you felt weird? 
That's the struggle I'm talking about. Accepting a truth doesn't happen automatically, right? When I have to, when it time came to me to accept the Sabbath truth, it took a year for me. I would go to Sunday church and I would go to Saturday church <laughs> every week. And then I prayed about it. I read as much as I can read. I talked to people. It looked so weird. But that struggle was led by God. In the journey, he was with me. He guided me. He helped me to understand, to have the insight into it, to have a spiritual struggle. And then eventually, I was able to accept. Now, that is the faith that I'm talking about today. It's not a magic or it's not a credit card, but our ability to understand big truths of God, embrace them, and change our life according to it. Now, the problem that I have here is all the people that Jesus said, O ye of little faith, happened to be Jews. The people that had the oracles of God, the people that fashioned their entire society after God, the people that had all their festivals fashioned in such a way that they know when Christ comes what to do, but yet when Christ was there, they couldn't believe him. Right? And the two people that Jesus said, people of great faith, happened to be the Gentiles who knew nothing about God. Now, why is it easy for Gentiles to have great faith? Or you should ask in a different way. Why is it hard for Jews to have great faith? Out of the, all the people, I would expect Jews to have great faith. But it happens to be different. Now, why is this question relevant today? We're not the Jews. But today, we have the oracles of God. We are the people of Remnant Church, right? We claim that we have the prophecy. We claim that we have the truths. Do you think we behave like the Jews behaved those days? Is there a chance that we become blind like the way these Jews are? We become deaf like these Jews are? And then a Gentile may get God and not, not us, the chosen people of God. So the question I have is how slippery my path is? How easy for me to become blind like these Jews? And what should I do so that I don't become like that? So I want to focus today on this healing of the centurion servant passage found in Matthew chapter 8, 5 to 13, and Luke chapter 7, 1 to, I think, 11. Uh, it's a typo. It's not supposed to be 17. Before I go into this passage, I want to quickly address the variation among the gospel writers. In Matthew and in Luke, you have this passage, but they have so many discrepancies. They're not the same accounts. So a lot of people think that, oh, the, the passage is not same between both of them, so that means this is not true. But I think I will convince you a little bit about the authenticity of this story. I only put uh, the differences here, right? In the case of Matthew, the disease of the servant was paralysis, but in case of Luke, the servant was sick to the point of death, right? Okay, we established the disease. They are completely different. And Matthew did not talk anything about the relationship between the centurion and the servant, but Luke made it a point to notice that the centurion loved his servant highly. Now, in both cases, the biggest difference is this. In Matthew, Matthew said the centurion himself approached Jesus, but in case of Luke, Centurion first sent the Jewish elders, because he's a Gentile, probably he can't approach Jesus. And then when Jesus is on his way to his home, when he's a little bit closer to home, then he sent the friends of Centurion and said, I am not worthy that you enter my home. Instead, you just heal him from there. Like I tell my servants, go and they go, and I tell them to do something and they'll do, like that you give your word and then he'll be healed. In both cases, the way of petitioning is a metaphor of authority and request for remote healing, right? That is the same thing in both of them. And the response of Jesus is same. He was amazed at the faith of the centurion, or in this case, faith of the centurion through the friends. 
And in one case, he turned around and judged the Jewish people for not having such faith. In another one, he just turned around and said, I marvel such a faith I couldn't find in Israel. And the manner of healing, you know, and then the, and the result, like, you know, slightly varied, but, but what I'm trying to say is like, if you look at it as a chiasm, right? Like, you know, the, the, like, like a burger, you have the bread and bread, you have the lettuce and then whatever the thing is here, and the meat is in the middle. If you think about the meat, right, in this case, veggie burger, meat of the matter between both parables is same. The way the centurion expressed his faith using a metaphor of authority and asked for a remote healing and the way Jesus was amazed. So if you can agree on that point, maybe we can go further. Now, before we get into the details, from here onwards, it's just a 15-minute sermon, right? So I'm not going to bore you too much. But I'm going to quickly go through all the points, so don't miss them. Who is this centurion, and what do we know about him? Bible didn't tell us what his name is, but he's a centurion in Capernaum, right? Centurion means he's a Roman-appointed um, you know, person, and he has authority over 100 soldiers. Usually, he himself might have been a soldier before, right? As a soldier, he would have been, you know, battle-tested and ready. He must have been so thoroughly, um, you know, experienced in every situation there out there. Now, in this context of the story, this man was in Israel for two things. Number one, to keep the peace because this is an occupied territory and Jews are always rebelling and then he needs to put the fire down and they don't have time to send the battalion all the way from Rome to you know, you know, call it so they have a team right there. And second, he wants to protect the interests of the Roman Empire. That's why he's there. Now, unlike a typical Roman centurion who is stationed in an occupied territory, this centurion exhibited unusual behavior. What is that unusual behavior? We can assume that this man was trained, born into heathenism. He was educated in the idolatry of the Roman imperial uh, kingdom and all that stuff. Naturally, if you are a conqueror, you would consider your country, your way of governance, your clothing, your food, and your gods to be superior to the ones that you just conquered, right? So you wouldn't expect them to actually care about Jewish gods. But here, the Jewish elders were testifying to Jesus, this man allows us, and he sacrificed a considerable personal wealth for the building of the synagogue. Imagine that. Why would you do that? This is unusual for a Roman centurion. Next, you know, um, as a hardened soldier, right, you have to be ruthless. Especially in the medieval times, you got to be much more ruthless where you're killing people in a close proximity, not like shooting far away. You had to become merciless and indifferent. And yet, this person exhibited unusual behavior. He loves his servant, most probably must have been a slave. Now, as a ruler stationed in the enemy territory, you're constantly on threat from external forces, which are the Jews, and internal conflict, right? There must be some other guy, number two, who wants to take his seat. He must be politicking all the time. You gotta constantly watch yourself for threats from outside as well as inside. And when you are in such a situation, you won't have quite time to reflect, let alone have a spirituality. You are there to catch everybody that is trying to cheat you and then kill them. But yet, this man exhibited some sort of spirituality. This is unusual. So when we look at this guy's story, we have five lessons that we can get out of. First one is, through the centurion's story, we know that our piety has no standing before God. Now, the Jewish people were telling Jesus, this man built a synagogue for us. He loves us. Now you have to do this for him. They were telling that this man has a great standing for us. He's not only a Roman powerful guy with a lot of power to kill anybody that he wants to. 
on top of that, he loves us, he built us buildings for us. Now you must do this. They are invoking transactional faith. And Jesus could have simply said no. But sometimes even though we use transactional faith, God in his mercy overlooks it. So Jesus was going through the motions. And yet, this Roman centurion couldn't dare face Jesus and said, sent his friends and said, I am not worthy. Imagine that, right? The power dynamics. He is the Roman centurion. He is the one who conquered this country. And Jesus is a lowly teacher. And yet, he comes and says there, Lord, and then says, I'm not worthy that you come to my home. So he recognized because he's wealthy, he's powerful, he did some good things to other people, he's in good standing in the society, especially the Jews, it doesn't give him automatic access to God. The only way you get access to God is when you surrender to him. So he realized faith is not transactional. But compare that with the Jews. If you are son of God, why don't you come down? from the cross and save yourself. If you're son of God, why don't you give us the sign? The second point is, our greatest need is our only claim on God's mercy. Now, Centurion realized his helplessness in healing his servant, and then he sought help. Now, the problem that we have is, if we don't know what's wrong with you, you can never seek help, right? Jesus in Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 when he's talking about the last day church you are lukewarm he said because you say I have I am rich become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched miserable poor blind and naked so he was telling I'm going to spit you out the problem that we have especially is that we don't know what we need because we never take time to see our inadequacies. That's the problem with the Jewish people. They thought they're superior because they are chosen generation. We do the same mistake too. Just because God chose this church doesn't mean we automatically become superior and then, you know, we have no need. We need to realize in the light of Christ how wretched we are spiritually. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, when you are mourning, you will be satisfied. When you realize your need, you will be satisfied. Because when we have this need, when we go to God and say, I have this need, automatically his mercy fills us, his grace fills us. But when we don't realize it, nobody can do anything. Now the third point is, Centurion believed that God is God of all mankind. Now, at this time, Jewish people, the, Jewish people thought Jesus is only their Messiah. He is the one who is there to, you know, deliver them, defeat Romans, and establish a political kingdom, which is also spiritual, and then make them glorious. But he is not the God of Gentiles. He is definitely not the God of Canaanites or the, the other people, right? He... He is only exclusively for us. So they define God to be this, like a box with the dimensions. The limit of God is only so far this much or so far this much. Beyond this, God doesn't exist. But here, Centurion realized, even though he's from a greater country, as though he believes that his gods are greater, he recognized Jesus is God of all people. He's God of Jews, he's God of Romans, is God of the slave servant that he has. So we tend to compartmentalize God. God is only God of Seventh-day Adventist people, at the most Protestants. He can't be God of Catholics, definitely not Muslims, definitely not atheists. And no matter what it is, he can't be God of bad people or evil people. But Bible says God gives sunshine and rain to all the people, both good and evil. So why do we exclude people? To have a great faith, we need to realize everybody is a God's child. Now, fourth point. Centurion believed that God is able and he's willing. Now, let's compare this with the 
disciples who were in the boat with Jesus, right? The storm came. They woke him up and said, don't you care? We're going to die. Because what happened is they thought Jesus is not willing to save them. They understood that he's able, but they thought he's not willing to save them. In the case of the uh, you know, man who brought his son with the devil possession, he couldn't believe that Jesus can heal him or he has the ability to heal him. And he said, help my unbelief. This is the problem with the Jewish people at that time. They know who God is. They know who God's son is. They believed him to be the Messiah, yet they weren't convinced that Jesus is able and he is willing to heal them or deliver them. But unlike these people, Centurion believed by invoking the metaphor of authority and said, you know, you don't need to really come to my home. If you are willing to save my servant, you can just save it from anywhere. You just say a thing and then he'll be healed there. You don't need to come to my home. You don't need to waste your time. You don't need to do all the elaborate stuff. Just let it be. I know you're able. I'm here to know if you're willing. And when Jesus said, I'm willing, he's healed. So a lot of times I struggle with this thing. I know God is able, but I, I think that he's not willing. Maybe this is not an avenue where God would, you know, bless me. How do we know that if we don't think that God is able and willing? Now, finally, the last point here is faith is seeing things as God sees. Okay. Now, let me be a little bit slow here. Most people around Jesus, all the Jewish people there, looked at him as a teacher. Some people called him rabbi. Some people called him good teacher, like the rich young ruler. Some people thought of him as a miracle worker. Some people thought of him as the guy who can provide us delicious meal. And some people thought he's a warrior who's going to deliver them from the Roman bondage and establish a superior kingdom. But they failed to understand who Christ is. They failed to see the mission of Christ as God sees it. He is a God in person here to sacrifice himself for the deliverance of not just the Jews, but the entire world. They couldn't see it. Faith is seeing things as God says. For example, when Lazarus died, when Mary and Martha were crying, he said, he's not dead, he's just sleeping. People were like, what? He's sleeping? But God looked at death as a sleep. When God sees death as a sleep, who am I not to see it that way? If I don't see death that way, that means I am a person of little faith. When God is in your boat, why does it matter whether it's a storm or an earthquake? You're going to be fine. Even if it is a tsunami, you're going to be fine because the God who created the universe is with you in your boat. But why is it that we behave that way? Because we fail to understand the truth. We don't wrestle with it. We don't study it. We don't understand it. We don't go through the journey of accepting the truth. So here Centurion understood that God is a friend of humanity. He's here not to just perform miracles, not to give food for everybody, not to establish Roman kingdom, but to save human people. That's why he addressed him as Lord, not good teacher, not rabbi, but Lord. So I'm at the end now. I want to quickly review. Uh, so what gives somebody great faith, right? We talked about five things, right? We need to understand just because we are pious, we give tithe, we do some things, we evangelize, we do these things, automatically it doesn't get an access to God. Number two, when we realize our need, that's when we can actually get the mercy of God. Third, God is God of all mankind. He's not exclusively for me, he's not exclusively for our group, but he's God of everybody. And Centurion believed that God is able and willing. So many times I forget that. I forget that God is willing and he's able to help me in my situation. Instead, I want to try on my own because I don't believe God can do this. And finally, 
faith is seeing things as God sees. This is the hardest one for me. I don't have that perspective of God. We all struggle with it. But as we journey along spiritually in our journey with Jesus, he would slowly open our eyes. He would slowly open our ears. He would slowly give that insight into spiritual things. And he will help us to wrestle with these spiritual truths and helps us so that we can fashion our life according to that. When God says, love your enemies, it is a hard thing to do, especially when you have an enemy. <laughs> if you don't have an enemy, it's a conceptual thing. But if you do have an enemy, it's hard. But it is Jesus that helps us to see things differently, like the way he sees, and helps us to go through this. So this is my, uh, my little prayer today, and then I hope that we all, we all in this journey eventually get to the place where Centurion was, to that great faith, and then have a peace in our heart. The biggest thing that we need is the peace of heart and a restoration of relationship with God. We all struggle with it. Not the peace that we have in this world, but the peace that Jesus gives us. So I hope that God blesses all of us with this peace. God bless you. Amen.